hello, hello, and welcome everyone, friends of the foundation, back to luncheon with the experts at Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I'm your host here to guide you through these awesome episodes that we have. I'm a filmmaker and I've been working with CCF for almost 10 years, producing video content, um, creating video series like this. And it's been one of the most impactful pieces of my work over the past decade. I'm really grateful to be a part of the community. I love this show and what we've been able to do with this show. And I love you all. And I appreciate you being here in and out every week. So uh, this week I was just thinking about it. I, I want you to, to share with me Go ahead and let us know where you are in the world. Of course, you know we like to do that. But share me something that you're excited about this week. What's going on in your world? What are you? What what win did you have? What was something good that happened to you this week or that you're excited about? In my world, uh, it's my daughter's birthday tomorrow. She's turning three, my daughter, BB. So that is definitely dominating the conversation and the energy around the family household this week. What's going on in your world? Let us know. Um, this is Lunch with the Experts, and it wouldn't be possible without our sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We really want to thank them very much. Uh, and as we do every show, we have a little disclaimer from them just to kind of set the set the tone for what we're trying to accomplish uh, with the show. And so we would like you to know that the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience at home, that you, uh, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch and the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse, promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. So audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or, or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. And as always, I like to reiterate that that last sentence is the real takeaway that we want you to have there. We're going to give you some great advice and direction, hopefully answer some questions for you, but by no means do we or our guest know your specific case. So take that information back to your home team and collectively make the decisions on what you do moving forward. So today our guest is Dr. Abraham Delpasand. Welcome, Dr. Delpasand. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be in this program and uh, answer the questions that your audience uh, has. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to host you. So for those in the audience that aren't familiar with, with you and the work that you do specifically, give us a little bit of an intro of, of what you do, where you work, and, and how I like to put it is how you feel you serve the neuroendocrine tumor community. Uh, I'd be glad to. Um, Basically, I'm, I'm a nuclear medicine physician. Uh, I did my uh, uh, residency training at Baylor College of Medicine here in Houston, Texas. Uh, I started with actually uh, doing a, a residency in pathology, anatomical and clinical pathology, and then joined um, a nuclear medicine program at Baylor, uh, uh, completed that also. But, Initially joined uh, uh, Baylor uh, as a junior faculty and then moved to MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, uh, which was across the street from us and uh, stayed there for 12 years. As the, at the time that I left MD Anderson, I was chief of clinical nuclear medicine and director of uh, uh, therapeutic nuclear medicine at MD Anderson. Uh, then, um, uh, it was, I think, about 2003, later part of 2003, uh, founded Excel Diagnostics and Nuclear Oncology Center, which is a premier imaging, uh, full uh, diagnostic imaging, as well as therapeutic nuclear medicine in Houston. Uh, this was in 2003. Uh, in 2006, I was uh, uh, able to fund a biotechnology company uh, with, the, with the main goal of developing new uh, PET uh, radiopharmaceuticals as well as therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. So uh, uh, this was founded in 2007. And uh, uh, since then, we have been involved in developing new radiopharmaceuticals, uh, both for the diagnostic indications as well as therapeutic indications. So, in terms of my neuroendocrine tumor history, uh, I can say uh, probably approximately 20 years now um, from the time that I was at MD Anderson until now. Uh, I've been uh, uh, very involved in this space. Uh, uh, that's the area that uh, uh, I have done most of my uh, research activities and clinical practice also. 
uh, except the first, um, uh, for the first time was able to uh, bring lutetium dotate to the state. Uh, we filed uh, uh, a physician-sponsored investigational uh, new drug application with FDA. And uh, uh, it took us almost two and a half years until we took it through FDA different steps. Uh, they had mm -hmm. questions, legitimate questions that we needed to respond. Finally, we were able to receive a proceed letter from uh, the agency to offer lutetium dotate to our patients with uh, neuroendocrine cancer. Uh, before that, we were using other isotopes such as high dose indium 111 octreotide for uh, uh, treatment of patients with uh, metastatic or inoperable neuroendocrine cancers. And then we were so glad that uh, for the first time uh, <coughs> to bring lutetium dotate to the state. Uh, for our patients, uh, so they didn't have to travel across the ocean to, to Europe, for instance, to get these therapies. Uh, then um, it was followed by uh, bringing actually gallium dotate uh, to, uh, to our patients. So for the first time, uh, again, based on an investigation on new drug application approved by FDA, uh, we were able to offer a gallium dotate to our patients so we can do PET scan uh, for patients with neuroendocrine cancer. And then, um, uh, then later on, uh, of course, uh, uh, lutetium dotate or lutetera was approved by FDA. Uh, our center was one of the clinical trial sites for another one trial, okay. which led to the approval of the drug. And um, now I have, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, 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 on the diagnostic side, we were able to uh, get approval uh, and commercialization authorization from FDA on copper dotate, uh, which is a PET-CT radiopharmaceutical uh, for our patients, again, with neuroendocrine cancer. And we have an active uh, clinical trial in collaboration with our partner, Oranomed, uh, uh, for performing alpha therapy uh, for neuroendocrine cancer. So this is a first uh, sort of an organized uh, uh, clinical trial uh, for alpha therapy of neuroendocrine cancer. Mm -hmm. We already, uh, completed the phase one, and now we are in preparation of entering into the phase two uh, clinical trial. Uh, uh, our results are extremely promising, and uh, maybe later on in this show, uh, uh, I can talk more about the alpha therapy the value of alpha therapy, the differences between alpha versus beta, which is the uh, lutetium uh, 177, for instance, yeah. is a beta inhibitor. So um, I guess with this long introduction, I'm ready now to answer. <laughs> that, you know what I like to call it? Uh, thorough. That's thorough. And doctors typically are thorough. Uh, no, I think that's really good, um, Dr. Delpasan, because it kind of lays the groundwork of, of what, you know, people will benefit most from this time. And so everybody, you understand really where Dr. Del Passan's, um, you know, skill set or his experience and, and um, his uh, specialties lie. So I would encourage you to ask those kinds of questions. And what I'm excited about is I know we get these questions every week. So I know that they'll really benefit from this. And so everybody at home who's watching, I always like to ask this at the beginning of the program. I see you're already sending the emojis and the likes. So you're getting a value already. Uh, if you know someone else that would benefit from this, especially with the unique guests that we have today and what we can talk about, you can tag them in the comments, you can share this video to their page, let them know our numbers are, are, are um, rising right now, which is great. We love to see that and we want to give us uh, an opportunity to as many people as possible. So get people in here that would benefit from this. They can always refer back to the video, but they always won't be able to ask questions in this interactive, you know, virtual one on one setting. So I encourage you to get them here. Um, I see everybody responded to my first question. Mary got her second vaccine. Awesome. Uh, Lee Hayes is excited about hummingbirds and bluebird babies. It is that time of year. It's a nice spring day in North Carolina. Uh, Kathy's son is starting high school baseball this week, and that's so great to hear because last year that was one of the things that really hurt my feelings was a lot of, especially seniors in college and, and high school, not being able to play sports. And it's good to see us hopefully getting maybe close to normal <laughs> normal again or at least uh at least the light is there at the end of the tunnel so uh before we get started everybody 
I uh, already asked you to, to let people know that you think would benefit from this. Another thing I like to request from you at the beginning of the program is if you see a question in the comments, I love the conversations you all have in the side, the sidebar with the comments, but if you see a question that you also have or are interested in discussing more, learning more, you can like that question or love it or any of the uh, reactions that Facebook gives you the option to, but either way, whatever one you choose, it allows me to see that, hey, there's a demand for that question. We get a ton of questions. Inevitably, we can't get to them all. So if I see seven people have that same question, then of course I'll ask it. So that helps me do my job better. And my job is to serve you. So finally, before we get started, I always like to ask if you have downloaded CCF's free Net Cancer Health Storylines app. This app is awesome and it, may, it makes it very easy for you to record your symptoms, medications, nutritional concerns, moods, and, and all of that. So if you haven't checked that out, do so. And uh, as always, our back end team, which is Grace Goldstein, uh, will be posting the links, the resources, the references that we mentioned along the show in the comment thread so that you can see those and click those links and you don't have to go out, open a new browser window, Google, you know, the thing that we mentioned, we'll prov provide that for you. So let's start the show. Dr. Delpasan, um, I always like to get a grasp, especially if it's someone who's been working uh, in this community with this disease for as long as you have. And I know some of the successes, I definitely want to talk to you about some of the, you know, like the Netter One trial and things like that. But historically, what are some of the challenges that this disease that you have faced specifically with this disease that kind of prevent you from, from doing as good of a job as, as you would like to? What are the unique challenges to neuroendocrine tumors? Well, I can say uh, in our field, um, uh, obviously, uh, access to new drugs, access to new uh, uh, radioisotopes, for instance, and also uh, going through different uh, regulatory steps to be able to offer it to our patients uh, has, has been part of the deal. I mean, it, it has been challenging, yes, but uh, I mean, it wasn't something we couldn't do, and we showed that we can do that for our patients. So uh, this is something that uh, I think maybe applies to, to any field and to ap and apply to any kind of a drug development and making drugs available to our patients. So uh, we have to go by the rules and regulations. I um, mean, this is the area that uh, uh, agencies such as FDA, uh, they, they have responsibility to make sure that the drug that is used for the patients, number one, it's safe, and number two, is effective. So this is their charge, and uh, there are certain rules and regulations on the, on the sponsor side, on the uh, physician side that uh, we have uh, to go by and uh, abide uh, those rules and regulation, and we are Obviously, we have to do that. Um, yes, it is time consuming. Yes, uh, it is expensive also. Uh, there's a, we always um, uh, need funding to, to, to do all these researches. Uh, and uh, so uh, these are all different challenges and different aspects when we are in uh, drug development and when we want to introduce new drugs to, to our patients. Sure, absolutely. Um, oh, I see Kathy says her oldest daughter's 23rd birthday tomorrow, and it's my daughter's third birthday. So, Kathy, if you want to send me a message offline sometime and let me know any tips on how to get through the next 20 years, that'd be appreciated. Uh, Dr. Delpasan, I knew this would happen because PRRT is such a in-demand topic for our community. We've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and start taking some of those uh, because this hour will, will fly by. So Heather says, if a person ended up with MDS from four rounds of PRRT, but their blood counts are pretty stable, is it possible to, to receive the newer, less harsh form of PRRT? And I'd actually like to learn what, what if you know what that means, what is the less harsh form of PRRT? All right, well, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome is, is, is a condition that can happen after PRRT or after some of the cytotoxic chemotherapy agents. Uh, it is not common, fortunately. It is relatively rare. Uh, during the uh, Nether 1 trial, uh, we saw something like maybe 1%, 1 to 2% maximum MDS uh, uh, in patients. Uh, MDS is a condition that is sort of a, a pre-phase of uh, blood cancer or leukemia. So okay. 
And we have certain, uh, the reason that we do all these lab tests for our patients before giving them the next cycle of PR PRT. And one of the reasons is exactly that, just to make sure that uh, we don't see anything uh, in the blood test that uh, might suggest further workup for, um, for MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, in terms of, um, if a patient has already had MDS and as a result of that, they have stopped the PRT, um, I mean, then we are dealing with a relatively high risk group that uh, uh, we don't wanna, uh, we, you know, we have to think twice if we wanna give further more uh, PRRT because uh, this group of patients, then they have the tendency of uh, developing leukemia and therefore, uh, it is going to be a high risk to do that. Uh, we have had uh, in our own experience also uh, when, you know, during our IND that we had for PRRT before even uh, another one trial, we had maybe, uh, I, I can kind of remember maybe two patients that they had MDS. And uh, in fact, both of them, they had received three cycles uh, of therapy and then we stopped giving the fourth cycle and we just watched them. Fortunately, their disease was stable for a long time. We didn't need to do anything else. In terms of less harsher, I mean, this is something that, uh, uh, as I said, I mean, if a patient has MDS, I, I really, uh, you know, uh, will be very cautious to, to give them any more PRRT. Um, Overall, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, less harsher PRRT, if you will, I think alpha therapy, might be that option that we're talking about okay. as less, uh, less harsh uh, on bone marrow. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for that is, you know, alphas, they have a much shorter path length, meaning that there is less collateral damage uh, to the normal tissues. And therefore that translates to uh, less toxicity, whether it's a hematological toxicity, renal toxicity, or, uh, uh, you know, hepatic toxicity or liver uh, effect on the liver. So um, that is what we are working on. I mean, uh, the preliminary evidence actually uh, suggests that that's actually the case. And uh, we have less side effects in patients with, um, when they, they receive alpha therapy. Uh, but of course, these are the patients that they have not had prior PRRTs uh, at this point. I mean, we are only using alpha therapy right now. Uh, the, the one that we have completed is naive or patients who have not ha uh, received PRRT in the past. We have another cohort separately that these are PRRT refractory patients uh, that we are enrolling for alpha therapy. But these patients, uh, they are not showing any MDS uh, uh, in their blood and uh, uh, they have acceptable uh, blood cells, renal function, hepatic <coughs> functions. And this is what uh, we are enrolling at this point. But MDS is a, uh, fortunately, is a rare situation, uh, but additional, giving additional uh, radiation therapy to these patients carries a significant risk, and I personally don't recommend it. Got it. Thank you. And thank you for your question, Heather. Uh, moving right along, as I said, uh, we're going to probably get a lot of questions today. So Marilyn asks, if the phase two trials of alpha PRRT are successful, when would the phase three trials begin and how many patients would be included? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, let me tell you uh, what, is a, uh, what is my hope and then what is a normal path. Perfect, yeah. So my hope is that if we can convince FDA that the results that we are seeing are extraordinary and it qualifies the term of breakthrough therapy, then the path to approval is much faster. So, and this is what we are hoping. And this is what we are in the process of uh, uh, providing more and more information to FDA uh, to tell them that really we are dealing with a breakthrough in here because of our results that we are seeing in the patients, both on the safety side and effectiveness. If we can receive that designation by, by the agency, then uh, we're hoping that we are not gonna go to actually a randomization trial, which is usually a phase three trial. 
uh, and convince FDA that the results that we are we have are so good that really uh, we don't need to do randomized trial and it might be even unethical to do randomized trial if we receive such a great results and if, if we can show this in more patients basically so that is that is my hope but overall the uh, uh, the, the normal path is that after completion of phase two, which we uh, we are enrolling about uh, 46 patients, then we go to a typical phase three, which is going to be a randomized trial. And typically, those trials require maybe a couple of hundred patients uh, that you need to randomize also between this drug versus another uh, control arm. Uh, but as I said, I, I'm very hopeful. I think the results that we are seeing are so uh, um, uh, impressive uh, and uh, uh, hopeful that uh, I'm hoping that we have a short path and uh, we receive this uh, breakthrough designation by FDA. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Marilyn. Uh, next question from, from Karen. This is uh, interesting. Karen says, question, do you know anything about taking a beta blocker to help lower cancer burden uh, and metastasis. Ever heard of that? Taking beta blocker for, no, I have, yeah. I don't have any data. I haven't uh, read anything about this. Yeah, topic. Karen, if you have any other um, uh, information or details to add to that, uh, feel free to send it back to us. Um, okay, Tracy says, can you explain what is CK19? And is there any significance for someone who has a weekly positive CK19 in a grade two PNET? And I'm not familiar with what CK19 is, I don't think. I defer to qu this question to my oncology colleagues, uh, okay. my field, and I cannot make any comments on that. Okay, no worries. Um, let's see. Dr. Delpasan, can we talk a little bit? I was interested about the Netter one trial, uh, especially with your... Um, direct involvement with that. Talk to me a little bit about the, the relevance of that, because I mean, that was so crucial to, to what, you know, how we're able to treat this now. Um, and I talk a lot about it, but I'm really interested to hear your perspective on it, like on, on how important that trial was and, and the, uh, the impact that it had. Absolutely. Yeah. Another one, uh, trial, uh, was an extremely important uh, trial for our patients suffering from neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, uh, for years, probably more than a decade, we, we had uh, experience with uh, this treatment, uh, lutetium dodotate. Our colleagues uh, in Europe, uh, uh, they had even longer uh, experience uh, using this drug. Uh, there were significant number of publications showing safety and effectiveness of lutetium dodotate, but it still obviously commercially was not available. Uh, so another one trial uh, design, was designed to uh, essentially as a randomized trial comparing the lutetium dodotate uh, to high dose of sandestatin, 60 milligram sandestatin LAR uh, to, to see uh, if, if uh, there is a, a significant improvement in terms of patient response and at the same time, the safety profile of the drug uh, needed to be evaluated. Um, success of another one trial obviously led to the approval uh, of the drug. And after that, patients, they, they were able to get this drug, their Medicare jump on this and uh, covered the uh, uh, cost of the drug for the patients. Other insurance companies, private insurance companies, they followed. So this was huge for our patients that previously, you know, either they had to pay for the drug, uh, they could come to Houston, of course, to get their medications, but still we had to, uh, you know, purchase all these components of the drug, do the radio labeling, do the QCs for, before giving it to the patients. So there was a huge cost to us. And uh, obviously, our institution couldn't uh, continue doing service uh, without charging the patients. So many patients, they had to pay out of pocket to do that. Having it approved by FDA, 
this was a huge relief for all of us and uh, now patients, they had coverage that they could get their treatment. At the same time, another most uh, very important factor was that for the first time, uh, we had a targeted therapy for this treatment of this cancer. Uh, treatment uh, for those of, uh, of uh, you know, those patients that they are listening to me and they have had this patient, they know that this is a relatively simple treatment, nothing heroic, nothing invasive. It consists of uh, giving amino acid at the beginning, you know, and, uh, you know, 30 minutes or one hour later, you, you give the medication to the patient. It's simple IV administration. There are a total of four doses. One dose every eight weeks is, uh, you know, given to the patient. So it, it's a relatively simple cancer therapy. Many of, the, of our patients, if you see them outside, I mean, you don't even know that they are undergoing cancer therapy. Right. They rarely lose hair. They rarely get severely sick as a result of the treatment. So this is why uh, it is very important. I mean, a, a treatment that uh, is safe, is effective, and at the same time, uh, uh, side effects are relatively rare. Of course, there are side effects as we have been published uh, uh, after another one trials. There are, um, you know, about 5% of patients, they uh, develop some uh, decrease in their white cell counts or platelet counts or hemoglobin, et cetera. But it's 5%. I mean, if you compare this to systemic chemotherapy regimens, I mean, many patients, they get seriously sick, they get admitted to the hospital to receive transfusion, they, they get infection, lots of other side effects that uh, can come with the, uh, relatively commonly can come with the, with the systemic chemotherapy for treatment of other cancers, as we have seen. So this was a great, uh, to me, uh, breakthrough. This was a great uh, step forward uh, for, for our patients. And now we see thousands of patients that are receiving this therapy. And, uh, and the results also showed that uh, it is significantly better than the, than the other alternatives that we have for our patients. So that, that's another thing that brought a lot of hope and uh, a lot of quality of life uh, for our patients. Got it, got it. Thank you for that. Uh, so we've got a group of questions, it seems, about scans. Um, Mary says, if on land reotide shots monthly right now, no new nets, um, how often do you recommend CT scans if, uh, if all is stable currently? Typically at our center, uh, if the patients, um, uh, they are in a stable condition and uh, we are just want to do surveillance, uh, we do it about six months, every six months. Six months. However, you know, each patient is different. Uh, we also do some blood tests and do marker studies. If the markers start rising, for instance, we do it earlier. If patients, they start having uh, any symptoms, for instance, uh, that is worrisome, uh, we, can, we can do it much earlier. But if everything is a stable, patient is doing fine, not losing significant weight, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, unintentionally, uh, not having um, any other symptoms like pain or uh, uh, or on the blood test, they are they, they just look as stable. Uh, you know, I think uh, six months uh, is a good number. Got it. And, and Margaret follows that up with there. There are numerous scans available, such as CAT, PET, DGF, gallium sixty eight, MRI. What is the criteria used to prescribe one scan over another? Okay, uh, I mean, that's a very good question. There are uh, two things that uh, we want to uh, when we are ordering uh, any kind of uh, imaging studies. Uh, CAT scan and MRI, these are anatomical imaging modalities. So you have a much better resolution in terms of uh, uh, any lesions, for instance, can be detected. The resolution is very high for something like two millimeter CT scan around the same number, depending on areas that we are looking at. So these are anatomical imaging modalities that are needed. Uh, the other group, PET scans, these are functional imaging. And uh, the functional, uh, so it gives more information about the function of the tumor function of uh, um, you know, uh, the way that this cancer, for instance, is responding to therapy, et cetera, we can see that much better stage by functional imaging uh, studies that are available to us. 
Uh, among the functional imaging, of, of course, the PET imaging is the, is the most commonly used. We previously, for instance, for this condition, we had our trio scan, which was uh, at, at the time, which was uh, the best uh, study that we had available for neuroendocrine cancer patients. But the contrast resolution of the images for arterial scan, they are not as good as PET scan. So PET scan, when PET became more available and especially uh, received coverage by insurance companies and Medicare, uh, obviously PET is much better modality with much higher contrast resolution to detect any, any lesions. Uh, but by PET, we get different information. For instance, with the somatostatin receptor PET, uh, gallium dodotate, copper dodotate, uh, uh, we get information about the expression of the somatostatin receptors. And this is something that is very important to us because uh, the, this is the basis for our targeted therapy, uh, whether it's a lutetium labored or alpha therapies, et cetera. So that is the kind of information we get in terms of expression of the somatostatin receptors. On the other hand, we have another uh, PET scan, which is a a glucose labeled uh, uh, F18 or fluorine 18, which is an isotope, uh, that tells us about talks about uh, tells us about the uh, metabolic activity, how how avidly the tumor is using glucose, and that's an index that tells us how aggressive the tumor has. So each of these tests gives us different information. Uh, but one thing that uh, right now is the, is the norm, uh, something that we have to refer in our publications, something that we have to, when we are reporting to FDA in a clinical trial, we have to men mention is, is a criteria which we call it a resist criteria. And this is uh, evaluation of the soft tissue tumor. There is a certain criteria for um, uh, when we are uh, evaluating the response to therapy. Uh, we can we can uh, label uh, you know uh, as progressive disease or a stable disease or partial response or complete responders. These are by resist criteria. At this point, unfortunately, I, I can say because I'm a nuclear medicine guy, PET is not part of the resist criteria, which I think is, needs to be added hopefully in the near future. But mm -hmm. overall, our criteria right now is. Uh, uh, based on anatomical imaging modalities such as CT or MRI. So the RESIST criteria is used for evaluation of the response to uh, any kind of therapies in oncology. And uh, uh, we need them uh, for this kind of evaluation, uh, but we get extremely important and critical information by our PET imaging that uh, we order. All right, thank you for that. Um, and thanks for your question, Margaret. Um, Dr. Delphasan, are you familiar with the net test? I am familiar to some degree with net test. Okay, so I had an interesting question from Linda, I believe, who was asked. She was concerned about radiation over time, as a lot of people are when, when monitoring. Um, could the net test possibly be used to monitor? I have seen publications related to that, and we have actually used it in, um, uh, in some of our patients. Uh, I think so. I think uh, um, uh, this is a blood test essentially that uh, talk, uh, tells you, uh, gives you information about the activity of the disease in each patient. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have seen actually in some of our patients, it has been helpful. Whether this can uh, substitute some of the imaging studies that we are doing, uh, I'm not 100% sure at this point. I mm -hmm. think that uh, all, you know, all these tests are valuable, but it depends on their sensitivity and specificity. If, this, if we have a test that is 100% sensitive and 100% specific, of course, you know, yeah, that's yeah. something that can answer all the questions. But since, uh, unfortunately, none of these tests are, uh, they have this degree of accuracy, uh, we, we have to have combination of tests. Uh, to to get an accurate uh, evaluation of what's mm -hmm. going on in our patient. Absolutely. Yeah, we get a lot of questions about the net test since it's kind of, you know, one of the new kids on the block, but that was the first time I had heard it from, from the monitoring angle, I believe. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Sharon says, what percent of net patients lack receptors? Uh, I think somatostatin. Yes, sorry. Yeah. That we're talking about. Um, well, uh, 
In terms of, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, neuroendocrine cancers, they have different grades and different uh, differentiations. Mm -hmm. Majority of the uh, differentiated uh, neuroendocrine tumors, they express somatostatin receptors. And these are, um, uh, majority of them are grade one and grade two. Having said this, grade three patients uh, and by the way, this grade one, two, and three based on the KI-67, which is a special stain that uh, pathologists, they do on the, on the tumor cells, and they give us a percentage of uh, uh, staining of those cells uh, uh, for the KI, uh, uh, measurement of the KI percentage. Uh, so um, uh, major, almost all, I can tell, uh, G1 and G2s, they are expressing somatostatin receptors. G3s also express somatostatin receptors, which is which is good thing actually, because in those patients, we have actually treated those patients with PRRT, uh, but some of them, especially when uh, the, the tumors become uh, more, uh, less differentiated, if you will, or they are undifferentiated, they are very immature cells that they cannot uh, express somatostatin receptors. So uh, that group, uh, uh, I think probably in the percentage wise, maybe around 20%. Uh, uh, I need to look this up because I'm more focused on the, the ones that they are uh, expressing the, the receptors. But overall, um, fortunately, they are not as common as uh, the ones that uh, we are seeing uh, with expression of the somatostatin receptor. But I can, uh, this one thing I can uh, mention in here, and that is, uh, for instance, nether one trial was only the way that it was designed was only for G1 and G2. So any mm -hmm. patients more than 20% KI67 was excluded from the trial. Uh, at this, uh, but you know we know right now, uh, and even then we knew that there are many patients with higher KI67 index uh, than 20 they express somatostatin receptor, but they potentially, uh, and they can benefit from the PRRT. But the way that nether one was designed was like that. And of course, uh, uh, we had to exclude patients uh, with KI-67 more than uh, 20. In our alpha therapy trial, we are not excluding those patients. We go by uh, affinity uh, of the receptors and expression of the receptors. And patients who are expressing somatostatin receptor by their uh, copper dodotate scan or gallium scan, gallium dodotate scan, they can be enrolled uh, regardless of their KI-67 index. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Rebecca, and a lot of people have this question or are interested in this, I believe. It says, how long can you get, get the sandostatin LAR injection and Zometa uh, infusion? Uh, how long they can get uh, sandostatin injection and zometa injection? Yeah, and zometa infusion. For how long, you mean? Yeah, that's what, that was the question, yeah. In, uh, we, we give sandostatin long-acting uh, every four weeks, and that's basically they can continue. Uh, uh, this is not something that we necessarily stop it as long as patient needs it. I mean, they can get it. Um, okay. In terms of uh, Zometa, I think that you, you need to ask it from uh, our oncology colleagues. Uh, okay. I, I do not use it in my practice. Okay. Um, we have David from Australia joining us. Uh, it says, I would love to know more about uh, alpha therapy and the copper 64 uh, pet tracer. I'll be on a study in June for the tracer study. It's all very interesting to me. So that's a kind of broad jumping off point, but um, do you think you can take it from there? Sure, absolutely. I'd be okay. happy to do that. Okay. Uh, in US, uh, Copper 64 Dodotate has already been approved. Uh, last September, in the middle of pandemic, uh, actually we received approval from FDA for this uh, drug, and it's now commercially available in US. So uh, it's not considered an investigational drug anymore. Got it. Uh, alpha therapy, of course, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we have completed the uh, uh, phase one dose escalation trial on the PRRT naive patients, and we are preparing to, to go to the next phase uh, of this clinical trial, again, for the PRRT naive patients. 
we had just a small uh, cohort of uh, PRRT refractory patients, about 10 patients that uh, uh, we, uh, we offered as part of our phase one trial. And that is near completion as well. By completion, I, I mean, uh, they are receiving the doses. Of course, we continue follow them up for several years, but in terms of uh, receiving the treatment doses, uh, I think uh, we'll complete the, uh, I think the last dose, uh, last patient will be sometimes maybe in August uh, uh, of this year for the PRRT uh, refractory patients. Of course, that's a, uh, sort of a preliminary information that we are collecting. And after that, we, we will have a, a phase two study on that group uh, in a much larger cohort that we will start hopefully after completion of this phase. Got it, thank you. Matt, Matt says, if scans of liver mets show no progression, but serotonin, chromogranin A, and pancreastatin are still running high, um, is increasing sandostatin to 60 milligrams a safe way to get levels under control? Uh, that's one way to do that. Uh, again, uh, our oncologist colleague, I know that uh, they do that. One issue about the 60 milligram is not, uh, unfortunately, not all insurance companies, they cover that. The drug is expensive also. Uh, so, uh, of course, each insurance company is different, and I'm sure um, writing a letter of... Uh, medical assistance by the physicians will help our patients to, to get covered for that. Um, but if a patient really has metastatic lesions and they are showing uh, some adostatin receptor expression, maybe they can talk to their doctors to see if uh, they, are, they, are candid, they are a good candidate for PRRT. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, friend of the foundation, Robert Ramirez. Dr. Ramirez uh, says, great talk, thanks. He always does a good job of, of uh, jump-starting uh, other conversations for us and sometimes uh, throwing us a lifeline when we can't figure out what an acronym means. Um, so he says, are there any other alpha emitters that you're excited about? Uh, by, by any other meaning, any other isotopes or... Uh... I mean, yes, there are, uh, uh, there are two main isotopes that okay. have been used for neuroendocrine cancers, uh, alpha therapy. One uh, is LED212. This is the one that we are using. Um, mm -hmm. uh, LED212 is, uh, works like an in vivo generator, if you will. LED212 itself is, uh, is not alpha, but it basically often decay. It uh, changes into bismuth 212, which is the alpha emitter actually inside the body. So it's a, we call it the in vivo generator, if you will. Got it. Fancy name for that. But, but overall, uh, LED 212 is labeled with somatostatin analog. It's a Tate, uh, uh, an analog of this Tate that we are using for diagnostic purposes or we use for Lutetera. Um, so that is one. Uh, the other isotope that has been used, there are some uh, publications on that. Uh, uh, is actinium-225 uh, labeled somatostatin receptor agents. Uh, that's another one. Um, uh, at this point, I'm not aware of any active uh, FDA-approved clinical trials on actinium-225, uh, um, you know, somatostatin agents. But, you know, this, uh, the good news is that this area is extremely active in research. And I know that many of our colleagues in different uh, institutions, uh, they are working on this, whether, uh, uh, you know, academic institutions or uh, uh, industry. Uh, this is a very active area of research, and I think that's a great news for all of us. Absolutely. Um, Dale says, does PRRT have more success with, uh, with a small number of large tumors in the liver versus multiple small tumors? Uh, uh, this is a very, uh, very good question. There has been a lot of uh, discussion in the literature and when we go to different scientific um, conferences about uh, relationship of the size of the tumor and uh, therapy. And if we are using, let's say, PRRT, would uh, beta therapy will be more effective on more bulky tumors and alphas on more smaller tumors because of the path length, et cetera. So uh, here is my bias, basically. I mean, the, take it uh, with the, uh, uh, as, as the, the feeling that I have, and it, has, uh, it is based on 
of course, my experience uh, uh, treating maybe more than a thousand patients with PRT. Um, I think anywhere that we have a blood flow, uh, ra these radiopharmaceuticals, they can reach to the tumors. And if, if there is good expression of the somatostatin receptor in these tumors, our radiopharmaceuticals can reach to that area and can give the radiation. Uh, the, the ranges of these isotopes makes a difference, I think, mostly on the crossfire effect or uh, some of the side effects, if you will. So, uh, and we have, I think, preliminary results that we are seeing uh, actually uh, suggest that this thinking is correct. We have treated with our alphas uh, we have treated patients with bulky tumors. We have treated patients with significant bone metastases and um, uh, with, a, with an excellent safety profile. So, uh, and at the same time with uh, lutetium dotate also different sizes of tumor has been treated. So uh, to me, as long as there is blood flow, as long as these radiopharmaceuticals can reach to the tumor, regardless of their pattern, they should have effect on the tumor. But another variant in here, we are dealing with the energy that these isotopes can actually deliver into the DNA of the tumor cells. The energy of the beta emitters are smaller or less than alpha emitters. Alpha emitters probably more than 400 times higher energy that is delivered to the uh, tumor cells. And uh, the way that we can actually affect therapeutic effect uh, comes and, and longevity of the effect uh, comes with how much damage we have inserted into the DNA of these cells and uh, how serious damage we have inserted. Uh, as you know, DNA has two strands. Uh, we have a double helix, basically two strands. And if the energy is lower, majority of the damage to the uh, tumor cells are single strand DNA damage. And DNA is very smart. It can, it can actually repair itself after the treatment. So there is, there is like a copy of the uh, strand that exists still and it's not damaged and uh, tumor cell can go ahead and uh, uh, um, make another strand exactly like before and essentially repair itself. Uh, the, uh, what we are hoping, and we, again, we have preliminary results that actually uh, proves that, is that because of a high energy of alpha emitters, majority of the damage to the DNA is double strand DNA damage and causes irreversible damage to the tumor cell. So the tumor cannot repair itself and therefore it dies. It goes to the process, we call it apoptosis and cell death, that it cannot recover itself. And this is why um, the results that we are seeing in a small group of patients, of course, that we have so far experienced is that we see a lot of complete responders. I mean, when we do PET scan after four cycles of, uh, of these therapies, we see a lot of complete responders. Uh, something that uh, I can tell you is not as common when we do the beta PRRT treatment. So, so these differences in the energy is extremely important and uh, the kind of damage that causes to the DNA of the cell, uh, majority of it, uh, of those damages are irreversible. And therefore that translates into at least much longer progression-free survival, you know, if not cure. Sure, sure. Um, folks, we have a little bit more than 10 minutes left. We have been speaking with Dr. Abraham Delpasand, and we've talked a lot about PRRT and alpha therapy and a lot of topics that I know you all are very interested in learning more about. Uh, so just know that one, if we didn't get to your question today, or you have follow-up questions, please reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation. You can message them here on their Facebook page. You can send them a private message. You can reach out to them on their website at www.carcinoid.org. And also this video will live here on the, on the videos tab on their Facebook page. It'll be evergreen. You can refer back to it at any time. And starting Monday, it will be published to YouTube for anyone that you know who doesn't have Facebook so they can, uh, they can access, access it as well. Uh, we still have some time to so get your questions in. We're gonna keep moving forward. We appreciate your time and being with us today. 
Dr. Del Passan, Anita says, can you comment a little bit on the dangers of spacing out the alpha, alpha PRT injections too far apart in time? Due to COVID, it's not possible to fly out to another country to get the next uh, alpha PRT treatment. So it's been six months since the first injection. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, this is understandable with the pandemic that uh, we're dealing and especially Europe still, uh, they have significant problem related to this. Uh, so uh, yes, the, the, the effectiveness of radiation therapy uh, and the amount of uh, damage that we can uh, uh, cause to the tumor depends on the amount of radiation that we give. So the effect is cumulative. It adds up to the damage. If, and the reason that majority of these protocols, they give maximum like an eight week difference is because uh, by the time that we feel that the effect of the previous treatment is kind of getting decreased, uh, depending on the half-life of the isotope and also overall biology of the cancer, uh, then you want to have another punch to increase, uh, to deliver more radiation to the tumor and uh, don't let the tumor to revive itself. So six months is, is too long. I think, um, uh, you know, majority of our uh, protocols, uh, they are as early as four weeks sometimes or eight week uh, interval. Uh, I think plus minus maybe one or two week uh, is probably okay, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not aware of any study looking at uh, uh, sort of effectiveness of uh, these kind of therapies when there is so much uh, time between each cycle, uh, six months, you know, uh, uh, from the previous treatment. Uh, I'm not aware of any studies that has looked at uh, this kind of uh, uh, regimen. Uh, but overall, uh, when we look at the basis of uh, the effectiveness of this kind of therapies, uh, it should be done uh, in about eight weeks, plus minus maybe two weeks. Uh, uh, I think these are the optimal times that we have seen, uh, and we have more experience in, in this kind of regimen. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Debbie says, uh, and this is asking about uh, the alpha therapy trials, how long after alpha therapy treatment will tumor start to die if it, if it does work? And can you give an update on the results of current participants? Is it like best case? Are there any no responders? Mm -hmm. What can you share? Well, um, yeah, in terms of um, the first part, uh, how soon you can receive, uh, you can see the uh, uh, response to therapy. We have seen it as early as after the second cycle, actually. Uh, we have, and this is uh, by resist criteria. Uh, we have seen shrinkage more than 30%, for instance, of the, the previously seen lesions. Uh, for sure, there is no new lesion, etc. as early as uh, two cycles. Each patient is different. Again, some of them you might see it after the third or fourth cycle. Some of, some of them you see three months after the fourth cycle uh, when you measure the lesions by MRI. Um, they qualify for, for response, objective radiological response. So, um, uh, but overall, um, and uh, the second part of the question, uh, we have seen, we have been pleasantly surprised by, by the results that we have seen after alpha therapy. Uh, and uh, for sure, uh, so far, we haven't seen uh, any progression in our patients who have been. Of course, we need longer follow-ups like any other studies. Uh, and the type of response that we have seen in our patients, as I said, uh, they are uh, very, uh, I can say, different from what we have been used to see in PRRT with beta emitters. Uh, all depends on, on the long-term follow-ups also. But, mm -hmm. uh, another thing that we have noticed is that we really, at this point, we don't have a significant uh, adverse event in these patients. We have seen, I can say, more commonly uh, uh, losing hair in some of our patients, which is reversible, actually. After the four cycle, maybe a few months after that, uh, they, you know, the, the hair comes back and uh, there's not much problem. Uh, but uh, this is probably the most uh, significant thing that we have seen. But overall, in terms of the uh, renal function, hepatic function, or all the blood tests, uh, 
uh, we see a very, uh, very safe, actually, response of the body to this treatment. Is there anything that you'd like to see more of, like that you're hopeful, like this, this is really what you're aiming for, or something like that? Well, at this point, um, I think, um, uh, I mean, first of all, we want to see the effectiveness of alpha therapy in patients who have already received PRRT mm. uh, with, let's say, you know, other uh, lutetium, dodotate, dodotoc, uh, any of these beta emitters. We want to see how successful we, we will be in patients who have received these therapies and they have progressed. Mm -hmm. uh, can really this therapy help them? This is an area of unmet need, as you know. I mean, after the patients, unfortunately, they progressed on PRRT, currently available PRRTs. Um, I mean, our options are relatively limited. Yeah, it's a question we get a lot, yep. No, we have tried additional two cycles, off-label, of course. Um, and we have seen some stability of the disease, maybe for another year or another 15 months. But overall, we know that um, uh, we want much stronger treatments for this group of patients. And uh, my hope is that maybe alpha therapy can, can offer more hope uh, to our patients uh, with this condition. Uh, I had a quick question from Linda. It says, please clarify, is alpha therapy, uh, is it only given for well differenti differentiated? We are, um, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, we are not... Uh, um, here, uh, we are, it's a little bit maybe on our, on orthodox, but uh, we are going, if the patient's tumor, they are expressing somatostatin receptor, mm -hmm. they are eligible for alpha therapy. Okay. We do not exclude, uh, you know, G3 group. We do not exclude any other pathology description. As long as they are expressing, highly expressing somatostatin receptors, we we enroll the patients. And, and the reason for that is, you know, these receptors are working like a lock and the key. As long as you have that hook, as long as we, we feel comfortable that we can reach to the tumor, we, we know that uh, our drug will be effective. So this is how we screen our patients. And this is part of our eligibility criteria. We don't go by uh, grade of the tumor or necessarily the pathology description uh, that we receive from our pathologists. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Claudia asks, is asking about Sandostatin. She's been on Sandostatin 30 milligrams for the past 14 years. What's known about the long-term side effects to your knowledge? I've, she's been experiencing uh, extreme joint pain the last few years. and I was wondering if that might be related. Ever heard of that? Uh, I uh, basically uh, one of the side effects on uh, on long acting sandostatin or sandostatin that has been used for a long time right. uh, is diabetes. Actually, that's one of the mm. uh, effect on the sugar metabolism in the body. So that's one thing that uh, uh, for sure uh, I'm sure uh, uh, her doctor look at this carefully and if there is any changes in the fasting blood sugar. Um, you know, they, they will give appropriate therapy. This is one that uh, we have seen in some of our patients, and this is one of the known side effects of uh, sandostatin therapy. In terms of joint pain, um, I don't know. I mean, joint pain is a, is a, is a very non-specific sort of a, a symptom, and it can be due to many different reasons. Uh, I really don't know, I'm, and I, I haven't seen this in my group of patients who have been receiving uh, sandostatin as, uh, as a, a very unique issue that... Yeah, it seems to be, and this is one of the things that, uh, Dr. Delpas and I love about the show is, you know, part of it is the information coming from the guests like yourself, and then part of it is the shared experiences that are communicated back and forth in the comment thread, which unfortunately you can't, can't see. Um, and it seems like some of the other patients are chiming in about their experiences that are similar and what they've done. And so that's, that's part of what we create here too, is a little community for people to share those experiences. Um, so we have time probably just for one more question. I just wanted, and, and I want to pose this one to you. Um, you know, we know what you're working on now. And, and are appreciative of, and, and grateful for the work that you're doing. Um, and I know from the talking to people like you that we've seen such, such a, uh, how can I put this, just a growth in our ability to diagnose and treat this disease in the past few years. So I wanted to forecast into, let's say the next five years, 
what things excite you about what you know what's coming in the future after what you're working on currently sure uh, i think uh, the areas that we can improve of the on this uh, number one of we have to continue this journey to to take it to the finish line to have these uh, alpha therapy drugs available for our patients i mean that's that's my first goal in here uh, our colleagues our collaborators uh, basically we are putting all our resources behind this to to take it to the finish line and have it available for our patients but uh, at the same time i think uh, there uh, we need to work on uh, making uh, uh, look at our regimens for instance just to see uh, if if by changing regimens for instance initially in the prrt we know that's the most sensitive time of the tumor response should we try for instance giving a higher doses in the first uh, two doses and then uh, sort of a decrease the dose on the following uh, third and fourth cycles uh, would this be any uh, have any effect on the patients um, if um, for instance if if we add other radio sensitizers to the to the PRRT, would that help uh, the, five, the the outcome uh, of the results, both evaluation of both safeties and effectiveness when we are combining uh, radio sensitizers, uh, uh, which is a sort of a chemotherapy, but uh, uh, our main uh, reason for that will be to making the tumor more sensitized to radiation and therefore to have a better effect after radiation. So these are some of the areas will be topic of future research. Uh, but uh, I can tell you uh, other fields, they are working on this immunotherapies. They are, uh, they are attacking this tumor uh, from their side. Um, so uh, the bottom line is that it's a very exciting time actually in exactly. of our patients with neuroendocrine cancer and it has created a lot of hope uh, for our patients and their, uh, their loved ones. Absolutely. Dr. Dalfasan, thank you so much for your time today and, and sharing some of your knowledge and findings and experience and, and all that. I know you have a plane to catch, so I'm going to let you uh, get on out of here. We're going to wrap up, but thank you so much for spending some time with us today and, and the community we have here. Uh, it has been my great pleasure uh, to participate in this. Uh, I'd be available anytime uh, your audience, uh, they need to know more about uh, uh, you know, uh, what we are doing and what overall uh, radio pharmaceutical field uh, can contribute to this. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, reach me and I'd be happy to, uh, to be participant in your program. Much appreciated. I appreciate you saying that. And thanks to you all at home again, as always, for joining us. We hope that this program answered some of your questions and gave you some direction. And again, I'll reiterate, reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation if you have further questions here on their Facebook page or at carcinoid.org, and they will get you the information that you need. Thanks, as always, to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. We couldn't do this program without them. And finally, my name is Ryan Bennett. Thank you for watching. Please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.